My name is Joe Laro. I am the director of Fats Domino and the birth of rock and roll. I want to talk to you about some of the challenges of making a film about the career of Fats Domino. It was really all about what existing footage I could find of the band and of Fats back in the 50s. Surprisingly, uh, there really was very little film footage of him shot in America. Why? Well, the reason is, first of all, uh, being an African-American rock and roller back in the 1950s was a bit of a threat to middle America. I mean, most of uh, his peers, like Little Richard and Chuck Berry, rarely, rarely ever were filmed on the Ed Sullivan Show and places like that in any type of you know, with any type of length, doing more than a song. I found some TV appearances, usually Fats just lip syncing to one of his hits, and then there was a bunch of pretty bad rock and roll movies that he appeared in, and it just kind of wasn't enough. I wasn't sure if I wanted to go through with making the film. Then, um, about six months in to my research, a friend of mine alerted me about a concert that existed in uh, the French National Archive. Uh, and it was an actual full-length concert of Fats Domino at his peak in 1962 with his original band playing live for 40 minutes. And it was just astounding. You saw the band and all of their power with all the musicians, the New Orleans musicians, Dave Bartholomew, Herb Hardesty, all the people that I interviewed in the film, you know, when the band was just really happening. And it took finding this concert in a country like France that didn't have sort of the, um, the cultural problems with having a black band performing live on a TV show at that time, rock and roll specifically. Uh, so once I saw this footage, um, I just realized I could make my film. They were playing everything that was popular with Fats at the time, some of his earlier hits, going back to the Rhythm and Blues days, it was all there and it was shot beautifully. And I wound up licensing that performance, that entire concert, uh, with the um, understanding that I could use as many tunes as I wanted. Uh, and so once I secured that, then I knew that I could make the film. That was my first hurdle. When you make a film about someone's life or their career, you got to get kind of personal. You, you know, you could do it um, without the person. You could rely on old interviews. You could, you know, whatever you could find. But that's not my style. I, I wanted to get to know Fats and, and see if I could bring the film to another dimension. And I did. Uh, it took me 10 years. <laughs> it's, it's a kind of a funny story. When I first went over to his house, he lived uh, at the time in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, where he, I think two blocks away from where he was born. There's Fats Domino's house, neon, everything, in the middle of a pretty modest neighborhood. So you could, you know, he wasn't hiding anywhere. His house was right there. You could knock on the door. But he still didn't let too many people really inside, uh, and certainly not to talk about his life. I told him I wanted to make a film, and he kind of acknowledged it. And, um, you know, and then when I wanted to keep going along those lines, I really wasn't getting anywhere. I needed him to sign a release, and it, it really went on for a long, long, long time. But in the course of that, I would visit him whenever I could. He was a huge fan of Boogie Woogie Piano. That's really where he cut his teeth. The old Boogie Woogie guys were his idols. Well, Fats liked James P. Johnson, he liked, um, he liked uh, Mead Lux Lewis, and all the great piano players. So I put together a video of footage of all these people, and I sent it to him. And I was told that he just wouldn't stop. He watched it every day. He was constantly on rotation in his house. And um, he wondered where it came from. And my friend who introduced me to him said, that's Joe, the, the fellow who wants to do the film about you. So I remember I called to talk to him and say hello. He goes, I said, Fats, did you get the video? He goes, oh yeah, Joe, video Joe. He started calling me video Joe. And from that point, it kind of broke the ice. 
and you know we talked about it I sent them some more stuff and it just kind of opened up the floodgate from that point on uh, I got to meet some of his bandmates that were still around uh, Dave Bartholomew and all that and it just made it a little easier to get in there and start talking about his career. My subject, Fats Domino, uh, elderly man, he began his career in the late 1940s and unlike a lot of musicians uh, uh, from that time period, he actually kept the same band members for his entire career, key people. Uh, his saxophone player, Herbert Hardesty, and his partner and musical director uh, and songwriting partner, Dave Bartholomew. These men were in his life and career from the beginning until the last notes were played on stage in 2006. Uh, and, you know, when you make a film like this, um, you know, you could go in many different directions. And because Fats is such a private person and is still with us and his family is so private and shy. Uh, I chose to not go the route of making a film about his personal life. I touch on it a bit, but I realized that he's such a private man and he had such an amazing career that talking about his career was enough. I mean, the man sold 60 million records by 1962. What, I mean, there's a story right there. I approached people that uh, were with him from the beginning. Uh, Billy Diamond, who actually got him his first gig uh, uh, and wound up playing bass with him and then being the tour manager. Uh, and then Herb Hardesty, the saxophone player from the first record, The Fat Man, he plays the tenor sax on that, and Dave Bartholomew. If I wanted to know about where the sound came from, and they were very willing to talk about that, about their influences. They were all from New Orleans. You know, the city of music, the city of an amazing culture that exists to this day, and they're all a product of that. And once they knew that I wasn't gonna be asking about some of these road stories and some of the scandal that every human being has in their life when it comes down to it, one way or the other, once they knew that I wasn't going there with them and with Fats, they really opened up and I got some beautiful stories from them about the music, about the, the way the music went over with the crowds, about the early integration that happened by the result of the music, the result of that, you know, white kids and black kids all liked fats and they went together, they, they came together in these concerts and no one could bring them apart.